that's what you that's hello uh, my name is Angela Epstein and I sit on the Yom Hashar Manchester committee we are the organizing body which put together the presentation for Manchester's annual Holocaust Memorial event to mark the Yom HaShoah. Uh, with me today, well not today, but virtually is our chairman, Jackie Field, herself second generation, um, who steers the committee and heads the committee. And today I'm gonna to ask her about what it means in the light of Yom HaShoah tomorrow, um, what it means to be the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Uh, Jackie, Tell us, first of all, what your late father's name was and um, where he grew up. My dad was Meyer Bomstick. He was born in Staszów, a shtetl in Poland, in um, December 1928. And he was there um, for quite a while until 1941. They could hear things were getting worse, but in 41 they went into hiding. Him, his parents and his sister. His brother, they had sent to the Polish army because they believed at the time that he would be saved that way. Um, he was actually never heard of again. So in 1941, they went into hiding in the basement of their flats. And uh, not long afterwards, after a few months, they were given up by their Polish neighbors and handed over to the Germans. Um, that was the last dad saw of his mum. Um, his father had died a few months earlier and dad was taken to a munitions factory in Keltza and was put to work there. He then, then went through a series of work camps and ended up in Buchenwald um, and that's where he was liberated from. He then... And how old was he when he... When he, he how old was he when he... Um, when the war broke out? He was born in 1928, so he was just coming up to um, 38, my mum's 17. He was 11? Yeah, um, and 17, well, nearly 17. So he was 11 when war broke out? He was 11 when war, war broke out, yeah. So never had a bar mitzvah, um, and then was liberated in 45. How long did he spend in Buchenwald? He was there for about six months and when Buchenwald was liberated he then went to Theresienstadt because that, that's where they took quite a lot of the survivors. Um, he was there and it was from there, he was there for a few months and there um, the British government agreed to take in um, a thousand orphans from the, the camps I think at the time about 732 were found and they were brought over to Windermere in August 1945 as a group that has become known as the boys and dad was in Windermere from August 45 until about November. I think a lot of people now have perhaps seen the Windermere children and if not I would recommend it which explains how it was when these orphans came over with no language, no family, no money didn't know anything and were looked off there and came to paradise in Windermere to recuperate. So in November... What did... Sorry. Okay, carry on, carry on. Yeah, and just to say that in November, they were all split up. They were kept together as a group and then taken in groups to hostels around the country. And dad was brought to Manchester. Um, now, especially in the latter part of the war, Buchenwald, a notorious concentration camp. Did your late father ever explain to you how he could account for his survival? And did he have any guilt or did he have any emotions um, that related to the fact that he had survived when so many, especially close members of his family, had perished? Dad, uh, we were very lucky growing up. I've got two younger brothers, Brian and Warren. And we, I can always remember on Friday nights or on Yom Tov, sitting down and talking, and Dad always talked about his experiences. I don't ever remember him having nightmares. I thought he was, he was just my dad, and I didn't think there was any big deal about being second generation. It wasn't a thing at that time. Um, so Dad's answer to why he survived, mazel. He would always say that it was a bit of mazel, but I think he was... He was made of tough stuff. He'd tell us stories about how terrible it was in the camp, how he was beaten for stealing potatoes, 
And I think one of the things that always stuck was that my mum could never make potatoes with their skins on because dad would never eat them. And that was a legacy from having to eat raw potatoes to help him survive and, and get through. Did he ever have any lasting physical um, damage from being a concentration camp survivor? Did you ever, if, if one hadn't known that he was a survivor, would you have been able to sort of know that about him? I don't, I don't think there were any physical marks other than the fact that he was small and smiled and had a real love for life and making the most of it. I don't remember any other, any physical damage. And I think we were fortunate that there was, there was the legacy there, but there was no huge emotional damage other than as, he, as we grew up, um, talking about what was lost, the life that was lost, the shtetl, how it was. We were actually very fortunate. BBC organised for us to go back to his hometown um, in 2001 it was through a Songs of Praise programme. Dad had talked and talked and talked about going back. We were all going back. We must go back. And he never actually put the plans into action because I think he was scared to go back. But we were actually fortunate to be able to do it. We went back to his, the building where he had lived. We went back and walked down into the cellar where he had been hiding. And, and what was his, Jackie, what was his, I mean, of all the places to go, and I'm sure they all stood great sort of, uh, emotional responses um, but equally uh, as a lot of survivors say when they go back to their hometowns a lot has changed modern life has crept in and taken over and changed the way what was once a shtetl so going back into a cellar um, how did he react and deal with it and how did you deal with it mostly we were all frightened of what his reaction would be I think we were scared before we went of opening a can of worms and he stood in this cellar, it was January time we went, in his hat, in his coat. He stood there and he cried, we all cried. And he said, it's exactly as he remembers it. And as we walked out, he said, that's it, basically, done. He, he, he closed that book. Um, he was fortunate that after the war, we discovered, he discovered that his sister had survived and she'd been in Bergen-Belsen. She had, um, stayed in Belsen until 1948 because there was nowhere for her to go. She got married in Bergen-Belsen to a, another survivor and had twins in Bergen-Belsen. And then, then they were, um, America also in, increased their allocation and she went to a chicken farm in New Jersey and she ended up staying in New York. But dad's attitude was he wanted to go back to Poland, see it, and then it was done. And the only person my dad's ever been scared of was his big sister. And when she found out that he was going back to Poland, she went absolutely mad. In the very best Yiddish was shouting at him down the phone. But, Do you remember any of the phrases? Uh, not polite conversation though. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really important for him to do it. And because the BBC had organised it, we did nothing other than turn up at the airport, and they get but dropped back off at the airport in Manchester. And it was a great trip and it's done. <laughs> why, do you, why do you think his sister reacted that way? I mean, the, every concentration camp survivor's experience is, is brutal and savage and terrible in its own way. And everyone has their own narrative and there's no competitive suffering. Um, but uh, many of us um, will have seen the har harrowing footage from Belson and the, the, the repository of, of, of just all human life at the end of the war and the terrible state it was. Do you think there was a difference in her reaction because of her different experience or was that down to character? I think some of it was character and some of it was the age difference. My auntie was six, months, six years older than dad. Um, and her recollections of life at home were very different. She, she was also, she was a tough cookie and quite rebellious when she was at home. But I think her hatred of the Poles and the Germans and the life that was uprooted was greater than my dad's, who was the youngest of three and still only a young boy when it all happened. I think she was probably more angry and bitter that, and she had to deal with that 
whereas dad probably personality as well because he was he was a happy personality i'm not saying she was <laughs> she was as well but she was i think just more angry have you compared notes with your cousins with your auntie's children about the um elements that play on your character as a consequence of being a second generation member of the second generation i've, I've seen myself and I've, i'm very close to my cousin who's only six months older than me um, her parents were both holocaust survivors my dad came to manchester and married a manchester girl he married my mum lily rosenberg in 1956 so the experience of growing up with one survivor parent is different to growing up with two survivor parents. I also think there's a big difference when the survivor parent is a mother and not a father. I had a very homely mummy mummy. My aunt's experience was, was very different. I know when times when we, we used to go to stay with them for Pesach and I'd be helping in the kitchen. And if I'd cut too much peel, off the carrot my aunt would go mad it's that waste i never had that experience at home and my so it's so sorry go on carry on. Ask. No, I was, so i was going to ask you so therefore to, to come back to the question bearing what you've said in mind um do you see a difference in the second generation experience of your cousin when compared with yourself considering also you're so close in age so there weren't there weren't different dynamics because of that no, de definitely her experience is different. She grew up with two parents having to find their way, who, who'd lost everything. Um, some of it was personality, but I think I do think their experience in New York was very different to what I had here. And I think, you know, with second generation are now being looked at in a sociological point of view. How are we affected? What damage has been done? And they're looking at... Um, the way we lead our lives. Her experience is definitely to my, different to mine, but the bond of any second generation, perfect strangers that you might come across, you start talking to somebody and you find out they're the child of a Holocaust survivor and there is an immediate bond. We have a shared experience. But I have to say, I, it wasn't a thing to be second generation. For me, the, the, what made it okay to talk about it was after Schindler's List was released in 1994. I went with my dad to a premiere. He was invited to a premiere here. And we went to see it. And he, I said to him afterwards, was that realistic? And he looked at me, he said, he said basically it was the nearest he's seen to anything that was realistic that wasn't actual footage, but it still didn't touch what it was actually like. And I think after that film was released, it became okay to talk about the Holocaust. I think when the survivors first came over, all they wanted to do was make lives for themselves. They, they didn't want to be the victims. They didn't want people to look at them as second class citizens. And they focused on working hard, getting married, having children, building up a life. And then suddenly it became okay to say, actually I'm a Holocaust survivor and these are my experiences. And as the years have gone by, because that survivor experience was unique at the time. It's become okay to be a survivor of the Holocaust. The people that my dad came over here with were always my uncles and aunties. It's Uncle Sam, it's Uncle Ike, it's Uncle, it, always the family because he didn't have family. And I think the first time it hit home for me was when I went for my first antenatal uh, appointment with, with my eldest child Nicola and they said to me you have four daughters I've got four daughters we've got four daughters yes um the the nurse said I'm sitting writing notes as normal and medical history what's your father's medical history what about his family when I sat there and I was stumped because I knew nothing he knew nothing he wouldn't have known if any of his family had any medical condition and that's when it hit me that mm, something's a bit different there's like this legacy behind me this, this history behind me and I don't know them there's a whole part of the tree that I just don't know and will never know and that's when I started asking myself questions has it affected me how am I different because I think I'm perfectly well adjusted of course 
How, um, how do you deal with, um, or how did you deal when your late father would, when Maya would touch upon the particularly awful elements of his incarceration and his experiences, bearing in mind what he said about how even Schindler's List couldn't go anywhere near reflecting how savage and harrowing his experience would have been. Um, as second generation, I mean, as any child, we want to protect our parents. and We don't like to think of them as being put in harm's way. But how did you deal with listening to the fact that he had been so savagely treated? I think because I'd always grown up with it. It, it was always there. And it's only occasionally in, in certain circumstances you'd stand and you'd look and you'd think, how did that 13 year old boy stand at that roll call? How did they do it? How can, where did that strength come from and that will to live? He was never an oh woe is me person. And I think that made a difference. It, it, he didn't want sympathy or special treatment. But I think what he always wanted was to teach us to enjoy life, be the best in people. I'm not saying that he was, he was a perfect human being. He was a human being. And he worked very hard to, to build a life and, and make a life for all of us. But sometimes you'd stand back and look at that person. And the more I've read and the more I've heard, you think, I don't know how they got through it. He, he must be right. Part of it was, was muzzle. He didn't have survivor guilt as far as I know. I, I never heard anything like that. But when he'd talk about home, he'd talk with such warmth about the living. He'd talk about the, the block of flats that he lived in. They had a sucker that was for only the men. The men of the whole block of flats would sit in the sucker and they had a competition to see which wife brought in the nicest fish. Or brought <laughs> it was, he took us back to what, real, what life was like. It wasn't drummed into us in a very dramatic, hard way. It was there. Yeah. I think because it's become more acceptable to talk about it, I've learnt more as time's gone on. And now sadly, he, he died 11 years ago. Can't ask him the questions that I would still be asking. No. My aunt's not here with us anyone. There's nobody anymore. There's nobody. Now, you, um, you touched upon this a moment ago. Um, there's a burgeoning, expanding field of research. Uh, I think they call it epigenetics. And when they look at how experiences of parents play out physically on the generations that come after them, um, it sounds to me like uh, your late father, Maya, was an extraordinary character. And there was an innate warmth and um, desire to be optimistic, even in the context of having experienced the worst that a human being can endure. Um, do you sometimes ever catch yourself and think this is I'm behaving this way or I feel this way because I'm second generation um, I'm not necessarily talking even just about when stuff about the Holocaust appears on the television I'm just thinking in the in the context of any human experience you, you touched upon uh, when when you had your eldest daughter when you had Nick um, but have there been other times when you've thought you've just thought I'm reacting this way because I'm second generation I'm not sure whether it's just me and my personality and my characteristics or if it is because I'm second generation. I think my cousin in New York is probably more frugal than I am because she grew up in a household where two survivor parents were very conscious of everything that they had and being probably more careful than we were here. I don't know that it's because I'm second generation that family is so important to me, just because I'm Jewish and this is just because of the way I am and we are a community. Or that my kids are the most important thing to me because I'm a Jewish mother. I, I, somebody who knows me may be able to say whether it's because you're second generation. I, I yeah. can't say that for myself. Now you're also, um... You're also a grandma to um, three gorgeous little boys, Kanina Hora as well, um, which uh, very sadly, uh, Maya, uh, your dad never got the opportunity to meet. Um, obviously, anybody who becomes a grandparent, it's an extraordinary blessing and a wonderful experience, I imagine. Um, but, um, but what about that extra layer, knowing that this was now 
the fourth generation, your second, your children are third. Now with these three little boys, you have the fourth generation. And of course, um, you know, you have, um, your brother's got a, a grandson as well. It's always very special having a grandchild. It, it, it's a real blessing. But when your grandchild is then named after, like, like our oldest Jake named after my dad, you feel that that person lives on in the same way as I am named after my grandmother that I, that I never knew. You know that those people are not forgotten and you can still talk about them. So Jake would know that he's named after Grandpa Maya. And for that- Jake is how old? Jake is how old? No. He's six. Yeah. So he knows he's named after great Grandpa Maya. You know, it won't mean anything at the moment, it's something that's been introduced to him early on and he'll know and he'll he'll see a picture and he'll know i've got one picture of my grandmother that was dad never had any pictures my aunt never had any pictures there was one picture that the people of stash have put together a book and in that book was the one picture of the bombstick family nothing else exists anywhere do you, do you know what what happened to your grandmother the grandmother you're named after did she <laughs> die before the war she, no, 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 she died in Belson. She was with my aunt um, and she died, she died in Belson. But when I look so at for you to, sorry, I look at carry on. when I see this smart woman, I don't see a, a peasant as you, most people probably imagine with a shtetl. She ran a business, she ran a leather business. I see this smart woman and I think to myself, I'd really love to sit down and talk to her or talk to somebody about what she's like. With Jake, at the, my girls were lucky enough to know my dad. They had, they had a relationship with my dad. They was, uh, my, my nephews and nieces had relationships with my parents. So when it comes to talking about them, we, they can tell Jake what Maya was like and then, and then the others as well. They'll be able to tell them about this person who was a person. It worries me that in two, three generations time that we're not still going to be talking about it. And that's part of the reason why I believe that it's so important that Yom HaShoah is commemorated. We're living through very strange times at the moment. Sometimes it's being compared to the Second World War. And in some respects, perhaps it is. I didn't live through that, so I can't say. But it's so important that we don't forget the people. And that's what's true for Jake as well. When he does a history lesson and they talk about the Shoah, they talk about the Holocaust, it will be his great grandpa that was there that survived it so his name being carried on which is a very obviously a very jewish tradition is really important and sometimes you look at your own kids and think i can see where that bit came from or i can see where that bit came from and if if that's the way that you don't forget the survivors through the children through the grandchildren through the great grandchildren it's the only way, and it's not just me because I'm second generation, it's everybody, it's all of us because it's all our story. And that's why it can't be just the direct descendants that pass on this message of what we've learnt during the show. Now you get, um, we're sort of drawing this to a close now, but you've, you've given us all um, a very kind of um, full-bodied idea of, of who your father was. He went on to become a successful businessman. He was a luminary at the local golf club. He had, you know, he, he had three wonderful children, grandchildren that he knew, some of whom he knew, and obviously um, has left an enormous legacy, all because this little shard of humanity amidst all this death and destruction and horror had the mazzle, the luck, as, as, as Maya said, to survive. And from that little piece of humanity, that one person, um, look at you all now. Um, we're mindful that uh, as a committee, Yom HaShoah Manchester, just like others that work around the country and around the world to, to memorialize the Holocaust and remember the survivors, that honor the, the, the six million and, and memorialize and honor our survivors, that, that we've lost a year to do that. Um, our survivors sadly are getting older there are fewer amongst us um, I know just today here in Manchester uh, we very sadly buried one of our treasured survivors who passed away Aidash Bulwa um, who was one of the boys as well yes he was, he was a member of the 45 Aid Society um, 
I'd just always grown up knowing him. He was the tailor that you always went to when your trousers needed, I'm talking about dad, whenever your trousers needed altering. Yes. So, so and, and uh, Adash was, uh, was 90, I think. Um, but uh, the fact is that because we've lost a year this year to memorialize the Holocaust in the traditional way that we would with a, an annual presentation, with a large gathering, um, and you've talked about how important it is to pass it on to the generations that come. Um, how would you say, what would your message be in this sort of the sense of urgency that the time is passing and that we will soon, um, unfortunately, be lacking that living testimony, the living history that you grew up with, the people like myself who aren't second generation but, but feel very passionate about memorialising the cause. Do you feel that sense of urgency, especially since we've lost a year this year? I absolutely feel that sense of urgency, mainly because we know that the survivors who are now in their late 80s, uh, early 90s, are just not going to be with us for very long. I would urge anybody, young people especially, if you can hear that authentic voice, go talk to a survivor, go and listen to them when they speak. We'll have books, we'll have videos, there'll be all sorts of technology. I know holograms are, are going to become more popular of the survivors. There's nothing like listening to that authentic voice. And I'm very sad that we're not able to do our usual commemoration, which honors the survivors who are with us and who participate, and we remember the victims. So if we can't do that this year, I would urge everybody, go talk to somebody read a bit more we've got a little bit more time than perhaps we usually have and remember that yama shower is still happening even if there's no commemoration happening that is our commemoration and we'll look to next year and hope that we're going to be fortunate enough to hear that authentic voice and that our survivors that are still with us will stay safe and well jackie field um second generation daughter of the late my bombstick lily bombstick Chairman, our esteemed chairman of Yom HaShoah Manchester, thank you so much for taking the time to reflect and remember and to give us an awful lot to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Cut. <laughs> okay, there you go. Wait a minute, I've paused recording. I've done that. Thank you. Yes, How long was that then? That was about 20 minutes actually. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to um, send it off. I'll send you a copy as well. I'm fine with it. What do do with it? I hope that was okay. I'm not doing anything. I'm just sending it. Finished. And I don't. Yeah. Do no, I, I just, you know, I just, I just let you speak, basically. Thank you. I mean, apart from no, just, the are just right. You know, you don't. They're, they're not. They're interested in you. That the, the a good chairman of an event knows that they're not coming to hear the chairman. I wanted you to just talk, and you did, and you you guided us through, and you gave us a very vivid um, oh, um, sort of oh, recreation. Do you think it's um, too early so, to have a gin? <laughs> Yeah, bugger off, go and have your gin. I'm going for a walk soon with Martin. Although I've right, got my cold, my cold poached eggs in the other room. Thank you very much. Speak to you soon. Lots of love. Bye. Take care. Bye, love. Bye. Bye.